funny time in human history. We have more abundance of resources than ever. But the question remains, is it making us any happier? To understand where our civilization is going, it helps to look at where it has come from. The first cities, like Chatelhoek and Basta, were formed over 9,000 years ago. They don't look like a modern city. They're very uniform. All of the buildings are the same. There are no public buildings. In fact, there are no streets. There are no workshops, no temples, no specialization, no markets, and no palaces. And if we look at the archaeological record, we find that for some reason we don't yet understand, people abandoned living in cities for a period of over 1,000 years. We started off clustering together to begin the agricultural revolution, and then at some point we gave it up and we went back to living in small villages. Why? Scientists have looked at climate change or pestilence as reasons for this, and nothing seems to add up. It seems as if the reason why we abandoned cities was because of social tensions. Nomadic people don't really require much in the way of property. If you're moving around, it doesn't make sense to hoard things. It just becomes more of a liability. And it seems as if we had to discover new technologies of centralization, aristocracy, armies, taxation, in order to transition from a nomadic mindset to a civilized, modern, city-living, urban mindset. When we next see cities, they look very different. There are streets and markets, and there is specialization, and there are very strong hierarchies and social taboos that keep everyone aligned. In the Sumerian Genesis myths, the goddess Inanna, Ishtar, steals the secrets of civilization and brings them to the city of Uruk. She takes knowledge of agriculture, for example, but also she takes knowledge of darker sides of humanity as well. The two go hand in hand and cannot be escaped. It seems as if our civilization was not able to handle the power of agriculture. We had to learn how to manage these resources. We had to develop social and cultural technologies as well as culture, as well as technologies and resources. And I think we are at a similar time in history today. Human beings are incredibly good at optimizing things. We are very powerful at selecting, for example, a wild mustard plant and optimizing different aspects of that to generate all kinds of different vegetables. In the 20th century, the Green Revolution led by scientists such as Norman Borlaug and his team, have revolutionized how we gather agricultural resources, as well as intensive farming methods, which enable us to turn dinosaur bones into food. And it is this which has enabled our global population to triple in the space of a single lifetime. And yet, as we bring more people into the world, we have developed more sophisticated methods of governance, or at least more optimized ones. And the lesson of the 20th century is perhaps that a hyper-optimized governing state system based on coercion is not necessarily one that is most flourishing, producing in human beings. We have mastered the ability 
to generate all kinds of resources and all kinds of safety mechanisms within our society. The bottom of Maslow's pyramid is pretty much sorted out for many of us on the planet today. But what about the higher aspects? Love, belonging, self-esteem, self-actualization. Are we finding abundance in these areas as well? For thousands of years, human beings <coughs> sat around campfires like this and exchanged stories and gossip about other people. And in a small tribe, this was quite easy. And yet today we are finding that our civilization is becoming fragmented. Social media and the ability for memes to get selected very hard and very quickly using information technologies means that in many ways we are retreating back into smaller groups where we're able to quickly share information that other people understand. But it's creating an echo chamber. And I think that this is eroding trust within society. And trust is a very important aspect of happiness. It correlates incredibly strongly. In essence, I believe that humanity isn't quite ready for the internet. We're not able to properly integrate these new technologies into our culture. And culture is so very important. If you think about a feral child, a child that has grown up without culture, in many ways that child is more like an animal than a human being, or a, as we would expect a human being to act. And yet we can also go to animals and we can teach them language, or we can even start to teach them morality and good conduct. So it seems as if culture is that magical aspect that turns us into human beings properly. And I have a hypothesis that perhaps in some ways modern homo sapiens could be looked upon as a form of biological AI, which happens to be instanced upon the hardware platform of a hominid primate. During the Industrial Revolution, we created new mechanisms for increasing our reach and our power. And later, we developed information technologies, first books, then later computers. But in many ways, we're still using the same religion and philosophies and laws from hundreds of years ago, and those haven't really changed very much. How can we industrialize that third aspect of civilization? I believe we have opportunities in things like machine ethics, a new technology which is a fusion of aspects of artificial intelligence, blockchain technology, and philosophy as well. And putting them all together, we have an opportunity to be able to create new rules and new ways of making people and organizations fit together in ways which are psychologically healthy. Ethics and morality should not be conflated. Morality is more about character and conduct and the aesthetics of a life well lived, whereas ethics is more about harm reduction and getting people's rights to fit together nicely. <coughs> In his book, The Moral Landscape, Sam Harris talks about how there may be multiple points on a landscape which are higher or lower, lower and which may be described as systems of ethics which are more likely or less likely to lead to human flourishing. And the question remains, if there's no perfect right, how can we get those multiple best options to fit together nicely? Children may choose to swap their lunch, for example, if both of them believe that they'll be better off if they do so. 
And I think there are many opportunities for moral trade within society, for us to trade off our different ideals of morals and find ways of agreeing that we can both get something of what we want without resorting to a zero-sum game. And if we can have moral trade, then we can also bring in moral markets. We can have systems where different ethical stances float against each other as coins, and perhaps those can influence machine ethical transactions. And these transactions are not based on sums and calculations, but more based on weights and tensors. And if we can unify ethics and economics, then we can start to work on negative externalities. We can start to include negative externalities within pricing mechanisms. Furthermore, it is possible then for certain kind of people to become literally rich in virtue. And if we also have a scoring mechanism on morality, then we can make it ludic. We can gamify it. And research tells us that even a meaningless increasing score makes people play the game better. So if we were all in a friendly competition to be as moral as possible, what would our civilization look like? I think we have a lot of opportunities to learn from nature as well. This is the tree crown shyness phenomenon. Trees are able to find the Pareto optimal positioning for their leaves so that they don't disturb each other. I find this remarkable. We humans find this difficult. We tend to think in coercive zero-sum games, and yet sometimes plants and animals are able to find these answers to morality themselves. It seems as if this is based upon things like entropy, these models of trying to create a best possible future with the most outcomes possible, basically preserving the future of freedom. We can harness these mechanisms to create a new form of morality as well. And I believe that AI is going to help us to generate solutions to conflict that we ourselves are not able to understand. Perhaps new systems of ethics that we haven't ourselves developed over the centuries. When we come together to do this, we can create solutions for all kinds of problems and tensions within our society. We can create games which are no longer zero-sum and which have no end, infinite games of peace and possibility. We can move into a new form of civilization, one that respects people and planet, and all of the inhabitants upon it, not just ourselves, and one which is sustainable long into the future. Together, we can all come together to co-create this. Shall we? Let's. Thank you.